video is going to be a revision workshop for the IB Diploma Atomic Structure topic. Um, it's split up into the SL content and the HL content and like normal we're just going to go through a ton of questions of all different types to hopefully prepare you and review this topic. So before we get started with the SL content, let me just show you what documents you're going to need before you can go through these questions. So this question document you'll find in the description for the video, this PDF which you can uh, download and you can have a go at yourself. I really recommend having a go before you go through this video. Um, the other thing you'll find is the chemistry data booklet, which obviously we need when we're going through questions whenever we're going through it. And another document which is just the IB data sorry, the IB periodic table oriented the right way so that it means that we can use it without having to like tilt our heads sideways. So this is the worksheet that we're gonna go through today, all split out into the different subtopics in atomic structure. We're gonna start with the SL stuff. Now in the SL stuff, there's actually only one um, equation in the data booklet for SL, which is this one here, the C equals nu lambda. So I know it looks like a V, but it's actually a Greek symbol nu and nu. Um, and if we go back, we can add that in here. So V equals, sorry, C equals nu lambda. And that comes straight from the data booklet. So you can find that in the data booklet in that table one. For the C, the C stands for the speed of light, and that speed of light is going to be in meters per second. You can find that also in the data booklet. So the speed of light you'll find in section two here. So we've got speed of light equals three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So that's a constant. We know that that's always like the same. The nu stands for frequency, and the units of frequency is per second, so seconds to the minus one. And the lambda stands for the wavelength, which is always going to be in meters. So often for this, they might give you the wavelength in nanometers, so just be careful and make sure that you're okay with that transition between meters and nanometers. Now there's no other equations explicitly in the syllabus for the SL, but actually the HL um, equation, the E equals H mu, suggests the relationship between energy and frequency, which is often referred to in the SL content. So you should have an understanding that as frequency increases, the energy of the particle is also increasing and the wavelength is decreasing. And I think this summary like of all of the relationship between the frequency and the energy and the wavelength is really what you need to know for this unit. Okay, that's all four equations. So let's have a start on these questions. Now, SL often starts with questions on subatomic particles. So just making sure you can definitely get these is worth the effort putting in. Um, now this, with the A and the Z, is asking what is represented by A in um, this equation. So A is the, the mass number. And Z is your proton number or atomic number. There's lots of different ways to refer to these, so just be <laughs> cautious. Um, but the mass number is also the number of nucleons. Nucleons being a word that just means the number of particles within inside the nucleus. So if they were asking about Z, the proton number, we'd have selected D. Um, but in this case, A, the number of nucleons goes at the top. So just make sure you know what the A and the Z stand for, because like that's not a natural letter <laughs> substitution, um, but it's a really important part that comes up a lot in SL. The second question we've got here says, what is the maximum number of electrons that can occupy the fourth main energy level in an atom? This is testing another like knowledge piece in that the number of electrons that can fit maximum in a energy level equals 2n squared, where n is the number of energy levels. So in this case, n is 4, because they told us it was the fourth main energy level. So 2n squared becomes 32. So in the fourth energy level, we're expecting 32 electrons in total. Number three, which statement about uh, these two isotopes of iron is correct? So remember this top number, is the number of nucleons or protons plus neutrons. 
Um, but they're both iron. So what we know about is about the same about them is that they will both have the same number of protons because they're both iron. And what identifies it as an element of iron is that it has the same number of protons. So here, I'm definitely selecting the same number of protons. I know they have different numbers of electrons because they have different charges. So there'll be different number of electrons there. And I also know they're gonna have different number of neutrons because that mass number, the number of nucleons, is different in each case. Okay, we smashed it through that first page, so let's move on to the second page. So this is about calculating relative atomic mass. Um, I chucked in this extra question about this nuclear symbol notation, comes up a lot. Um, so they're asking for iron 54. So the symbol for iron is Fe, and this is about knowing that that 54 represents a mass number, so it's gonna go at the top, it's the A, so 54 up here. And then I'm gonna check my periodic table, so iron is here in the middle. So iron's proton number is 26. So that 26 is gonna go at the bottom, and that would get you the one mark for that question. So just make sure you're okay with the organization of. Um, how we do the nuclear symbol notation. The next thing we're going to look at is the mass spectrometry analysis. Now mass spectrometry is something that comes up in a lot more detail in topic 11, so if you've got there then you probably understand it a lot more by this point, but this is a way of us seeing which isotopes are present and in what abundance they are present, so like which isotope is the most common of all of the isotopes. So here I can see that iron 56 is the most common isotope, but I also have iron 54 and 57 and 58 existing in some part. So they're asking us to calculate the relative atomic mass. So that's like a weighted average. So if I had like 100 atoms of iron, on average, how much is that going to weigh? So the way that we do that is we take each individual uh, mass number and you can times it by the percentage. So what we're really trying to do is we're saying like, okay, cool, if I had 100 atoms, how much would that weigh? And then I'm gonna divide it by 100. So I'm gonna do 54 times the 5.84, and then I'm gonna plus that with the 56 times 91.68, plus the 57 times the 2.17, plus the 58 times 0.31. I'm gonna do that whole thing and that will give me how much on average 100 atoms would weigh. And then I'm gonna divide it by 100 and that gives me 55.91111 in my calculator. Now in the question, they asked for it to two decimal places. It is really easy to gloss over these like decimal places and significant figures like requests. So just make sure that when you're going through your test at the end, that you're rereading the question, not just your answers, and double checking that you've rounded to the correct number of decimal places. So here, this one should be 55.91, and the units are grams per mole, and that'll get you the full two marks. Now, obviously, if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to just uh, take these percentages and like convert them to times 0.0584 and convert them to percentages and then not have to divide by 100 later. Um, but this is the way that I found that my students find it easiest to conceptually think about. So make sure that you practice this type of calculation. There is another example which sometimes comes up in SL questions um, where you have to calculate the relative atomic, sorry, you have to calculate the percentage from the relative atomic masses um, that they give you. Um, so make sure you go through some of those examples too. They can be a bit tricky, uh, but this is definitely the most common type of example that comes up in the SL. Um, I can check that this answer looks kind of right because it's almost 56, uh, which kind of makes sense. Like the most abundant is 56 and like the biggest percentage is the one slightly lower than 56 this 54 one So I'm expecting a number to come out just under 56 So I can do like a self check with these types of calculations where I can't with some other types So make sure you're using the opportunity if you get an answer that comes out at like 300 You know that you've made a mistake in your calculation and that you should redo it so let's move on to uh, electronic configuration this is 
a quite complex topic. So I'm going to go through these questions, but if you don't understand, please go and speak to your teacher um, and watch some other videos because we're just going to go through how to answer these types of questions here today. So the first one is the shapes of orbitals. So the, this one is asking for the shape of an S orbital. And S orbitals are spherical shapes, uh, or they're circle in two dimensions. Um, this one here is a P orbital. Um, and these two both show bonding orbitals, um, which you don't have any expectation of knowing. Um, so you've got the overlap between an S and a P and an overlap between two P orbitals. Um, so if you're asking for an S atomic orbital, you're just looking for the sphere. Sometimes they'll ask you to sketch it out yourself also always only worth one mark. Also, you might be asked to actually do the electronic configurations um, and to show which how many other electrons there are in different types of suborbitals. So this one's asking for the electron configuration of a chromium atom. Now for my students, I teach them the Ku Cro anomaly, which basically means that for copper and chromium, they're going to be a bit messed up. They don't work exactly how you think they're going to um, because of those half filled um, and full d orbitals. So if we have a look at these options here, you've got one where there's 4s1, 3d4, this one's 3d3, 4s2, 3d4, and 4s1, 3d5. So let's have a look at my periodic table and have a look at where we find chromium. So chromium is here, right in the middle of the D block. So if we're looking at our periodic table, hopefully you know that like this block here, it's a really dodgy rectangle. <laughs> this block here, we call the S block. So anything that's here is gonna finish in, this is S1 and S2. So for sodium here, I know that the outer orbital is going to be 3s1, magnesium's 3s2. So I'm using this 3 here and the s1 and s2 from the top. So I know what the like final one is going to be. Um, this one here is the p block. So you're going to have p1, p2, p3, p4 p5, p6. So I know that like sulfur will end in 3, p4. Okay, so it's kind of like you're playing a game of like battleships. Um, the middle one, the middle one is the D block. So all of the outer electrons are going to be in the D orbital, or the D sub level I should say. So here you have D1, D2, all the way up to D10. So when we go to chromium, we're getting to D4. So I'm expecting it to be D4. Um, it's in the fourth row, but unfortunately D works a bit weird in that this we call the 3D, this one's the 4D, the 5D, etc. Um, so it doesn't quite line up with the period number like the S and the P do. And then your bottom one, this is your F block. Okay, I've really messed up my periodic table there. So chromium should finish in 3D4, should be the outer, let's go back to here. So it should finish in 3D4, okay? So let's just move that a second and fill in the rest of the uh, sublevels leading up to 3D4. So you start with your 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3 S2, oh, mess this up, let's move it across more, 3P6, and then we're getting to the point where we're at 3D4, but actually the 4S2 comes before the 3D4. Now because 4S and 3D are really, really similar in energy, we can kind of treat them like they're all at the same energy level. So if there's a potential for both to be kind of half full, then that's what they're going to do, following kind of Hun's rule, but not at the same time. So remembering that copper and chromium are a bit weird, because one of these electrons from the 4S moves to the 3D. So it actually finishes in 4s1, 3d5. So the right answer for this question is d. This brackets with the argon just means the electronic configuration of argon, which is essentially like all of this. 
So I'm just simplifying that and being like, yeah, argon plus this 4s1 3d5. But remember that chromium and copper are weird. Everything else kind of works normally. Copper and chromium are gonna mess you up every time and they come up more often than the other um, examples. So let's have a look at another one. It says bromine can form the bromate ion. Um, state the electronic configuration of a bromine atom. So let's go back to my very neat periodic table here. Let's use a different color so we're not messing up entirely. So bromine is all the way here in group 17. So I know it's gonna finish P5 and it's in period four. So the final one is gonna be 4P5. So if we go back, we know the final one is 4P5. So I'm gonna fill up everything up to that point. So you can actually do this kind of using your periodic table too. So I know I've got 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 4S2, 3D10, and then 4P5. So you're kind of counting the orbitals as you go along. So let me fill that out for you. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. You could put the 3d10 here if you want to put them in numerical order, or you can reverse these. So these can go either way around. Everything's fine both ways. Nobody cares that much. Um, in addition, if you wanted to simplify this, if you wanted to simplify this, you're welcome to simplify it by going back up to the uh, noble gas before, so argon. So we can also take the argon out. So remember that argon is all of this. So I could just write argon plus the 3D10 for S2 for P5, because it doesn't specify in the question that they want a full electronic configuration, in which case you would need to do this like big row at the beginning. Um, but if it does request that, then make sure that you do the full one. Um, otherwise you can simplify with this noble gas, it, like shortening configuration. Um, don't put any other elements in the brackets other than a noble gas. You can only do this with the noble gases or those in group 18. Okay, you can't just put like a random element in there and then hope it'll be okay. Um, if you want to double check your working, you can calculate the number of electrons in total and add them all together. So this gives you 35 electrons. If I go back to my periodic table, I can see that the bromine should have 35 electrons. So I know that I've like done it correctly. Um, so doing the check and knowing how to check is really, really important. The last part of this question says, sketch the orbital diagram of the valence shell of a bromine atom. So the valence shell in this case is the fourth energy level. So the fourth contains the 4s and the 4p. So they're checking whether you can do the arrow in boxes notation. So the 4s is lower in energy than the 4p. And the 4s contains one orbital, one box, whereas the 4p contains three orbitals or three boxes, three like regions of space where you could potentially find those electrons. So for the 4s, it's 4s2. So they're checking whether you know that these arrows should go in opposite directions, showing that they're opposite spin to each other. And there's only two arrows in each box. For the 4P, I'm doing 4P5. So the way we fill it up is we go one, two, three, and then we double up four, five. You can use uh, double headed arrows with this also. It doesn't really matter. Um, both ways is absolutely fine. Okay, that's all for uh, the electron configuration. You need tons of practice at this just to make sure that you're super fluent in it because it should be something you can do pretty quickly by the end of IB. So let's move on to the final part in the SL atomic structure, which is the hydrogen emission spectrum. Um, so in this first question, it's asking us to draw the first four energy levels of a hydrogen atom, labeling them N, one, two, three, and four. 
So in the hydrogen emission spectrum, if I'm drawing energy levels, I'm going to start from the bottom. So this would be n equals 1. And then I'm going to show that my energy levels are converging. Now, what I mean by that is that they are getting closer together as you move upwards. So if we label these with n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals four and you can draw these however you like but those lines need to be getting closer together as the energy increases we call that converging um, and that's what the mark is for in this case the second part of this question let's have a look it says draw the lines on your diagram that represent the electronic transitions to n equals two in the emission spectrum so if we're emitting radiation, that means that the energy of the electron is decreasing because it's emitting radiation out. So it must be losing energy itself so that the conservation of energy is maintained. So if we're going to n equals two, let's change color so that we can see this better. Going to n equals two, we can draw two transitions that would come up in the emission spectrum for uh, going to n equals 2, which is in the visible region. So these two arrows, you'd have to draw both to get that one mark. They're the only two that are possible for this example. So for emission, the arrows have to be going downwards. If you were talking about absorption, then they could be going upwards, but we pretty much only talk about emission in uh, SL chem. Um, and they're going downwards here. Now these types of questions people often miss out, especially if this line didn't exist here, because if there's no lines, people are like, oh, is there even a question there? I missed that out. Like I lost that mark because I just didn't read the question. I didn't see it there. So when you're going back through your paper, check all of these little like mark points and check that you've done something to deserve each of those points because annotating a diagram or like drawing a line of best fit is often something that people miss out on doing and that will score you valuable points and you need every one that you can pick up. Okay, let's have a look at a MULP choice that could come up for the emission spectrum. So this one here says, which electronic transition emits radiation of the longest wavelength? So first of all, they're saying it emits radiation. So remember, emission means that the electron has to be falling down energy levels. So I'm gonna eliminate these two options immediately because those arrows are going up and I don't care about those. So it's really a matter of A or C. A is a longer one than C. It's a bigger drop, a bigger energy drop. So I need to think about whether a bigger energy drop means a longer wavelength or a shorter wavelength. So remember at the beginning where I said that Oh, okay, increase in energy means an increase in frequency, which means a decrease in wavelength. So the higher the energy, the lower the wavelength. So here I want the biggest energy gap for the lowest wavelength, but in this case, I want the longest. So they want the biggest wavelength. So for a big wavelength, I want a small energy. So the smallest energy is gonna be C. So this, is really, really helpful for solving these problems and going through it kind of step by step. Um, and I'll see this kind of thing written all over my students' um, scripts because they're trying to like remove all of those trends from their brain so that they can just use them in the question rather than having to think about too many things at once. So last one for the SL, another um, another emission spectrum. So this is how the emission spectrum like actually shows up. This is what we see through our spectroscope. They're saying which is the correct for the line emission spectrum for hydrogen. So you can see the lines are converging and remember that lines converge towards higher energy. Okay, so higher energy they converge. So it means I also know that moving this direction they have higher frequency and I also know that this direction, they're getting a lower and lower wavelength as I go further towards the right. So this is going to help me to solve the problem. So it says line M has a higher energy than line N. That is incorrect. M is not higher energy than N. Line N has a lower frequency than line N. That is also incorrect line N would have a higher frequency than M would. Line M has a longer wavelength. 
Now that one is correct because M is further to the left. Remember that is lower, um, like longer wavelength and lower wavelength is on the right of this. So M would have a longer wavelength. Lines converge at lower energy. That's just absolutely incorrect and definitely shouldn't be selected for this question. Okay, that was all for the SL content. So let's have a look at the HL content for this um, unit. There's one equation that we need to add into this. So the equation that we need to add in is here, this one, the E equals H nu appears here. So the energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency. So here we're gonna write E equals H nu. So the energy in this is in joules. Planck's constant comes in joule seconds. So Planck's constant, you actually will find in my list of constants here. Let's have a look, where's Planck's constant? So Planck's constant is this one here, the 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds. So appears here, it's a constant, doesn't move. So new, the frequency is still in seconds to the minus one or hertz. So this equation comes up more often in the HL content. Um, this one, like we said, you can find in the uh, data booklet. So this appears in the data booklet as well as Planck's constant itself appearing in the data booklet. So you can utilize all of that whilst you're solving your questions. Okay, one final equation in the HL content. Um, it's not strictly an equation and not even really in the syllabus, but it's worth putting here because it's something that confuses people. You also have to be able to calculate the first ionization energy using the convergence limit from those hydrogen emission spectrums that we talked about in the SL. So if you want to work out the first ionization energy, you can actually use the highest energy photon that's emitted from the emission spectra because if you know the most energetic photon that's emitted what that means is it's essentially the same amount of energy that's required for a photon to excite that electron outside of the atom itself which we call ionization removing the electron from the atom so this is normally in joules when we work it out from this equation here but first, ionization energy is in joules per mole. So we need to know how much energy it would take for a mole of electrons to be removed from the atom. So if you know how much energy it is for one electron to be removed, we're just going to times this by Avogadro's number, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And you can find that in the uh, data booklet um, in section 2. Okay, let's have a look at some questions on first ionization energy. This one here is a very generic question. It says the first six ionization energies of an atom are given below. Explain the large increase in ionization energy from ionization energy three to ionization energy four. So you can see between three and four, you're getting this massive jump from 2744 to over 11,000 kilojoules per mole. And the only thing that can make the fourth electron so much more difficult to remove than the third electron was, is that that fourth electron must be in a lower energy level. So that's the first statement that we're gonna make. We're gonna say the fourth electron is in a lower, energy level and that will get you one mark for the second mark you need to explain what you're saying so because it's in a lower energy level this means that it has a higher attraction uh, to the nucleus because it's closer to the nucleus you could also nucleus <laughs> you could also get a mark for saying that it experiences less shielding because you've got fewer full energy levels between the outer electron and the nucleus now either way any of these things is going to pick you up two marks for this question let's have a look at another one so another way this can look is they can ask you to actually plot the relative um, ionization energies um, for an individual element so this one is asking about sodium. So if we look at our periodic table, sodium is here over in the third period and the first part of that S block. So that means that the outer electron, remember, is gonna be 
3s, I'm not enjoying where that one is, let's try again, 3s1, okay, it's the outer um, orbital, the outer sublevel that's occupied. So if we fill in the rest of it, we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So that's my um, electron configuration for sodium. And this is going to help us to work out which electrons are easier to remove. So for sodium, this electron is the first one that's going to go, and relatively speaking, that's going to be the easiest one to remove. The next electrons, the second electron, the third electron, and the fourth electron are all going to come from this 2p sublevel. So the second one is going to be much harder to remove than the first one was because it's from energy level 2 versus energy level 3. It is much closer to the nucleus. Number three is going to be more difficult again, but only a little bit more difficult. You're not looking for that same jump every time because it's still coming from the 2p. The fourth one, also coming from the 2p, again is going to be a bit more difficult just because there's now less electrons to be attracted. So each electron is experiencing more attraction to that same number of protons. So you're expecting this general upward trend between the second, third and fourth but make sure that there's a massive jump between ionization energy number one and ionization energy number two. So in the last few questions, we've been looking at trends in ionization energy uh, as we remove more and more electrons from one element. So in these couple of questions, we're looking at what happens if with the trends in first ionization energy across a period. This also comes up in periodicity, um, so it isn't like localized to this topic, so it's worth making sure that you understand kind of what's causing all of the trends um, in the periodic table. So what we've got here is a question number 13, which shows the first ionization energy of successive elements across period two. So for period two, we're talking lithium all the way up through to neon. So you've got lithium, beryllium, boron, and then you've got carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. So that's your period two all the way across here. Okay, so what we're saying is like, what would the trend look like if I was to remove one electron from each of these? So you can see, so you can see here that it's getting more difficult to remove those electrons as you go across the period. Um, because as you remove electrons, you are like, there's more protons as you go across the group. So of course it's more difficult to remove an electron because all of these outer electrons are all in the second energy level. So all are pretty similar. So when we're thinking about the like complexities of this trend, what we're thinking about is where is that outer electron coming from? So for lithium, let's have a look, lithium, the outer electron is in 2s1, beryllium's 2s2, boron is 2p1, carbon 2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6, all the way along. So we're thinking about what happens as you go across the group. So if we look at these, you can see that this one has this dip between group 2 and group 13, the beryllium and the boron. Am I expecting that or not? Should group 13 be much easier to remove than group 2 was? Yeah, because here you've got the 2p and the 2s. The 2p is easier to remove electrons from, a, a single electron in the 2p is easier than the 2s because the 2s is a fully occupied orbital. Um, and you've also just got more protons and those electrons are slightly further away from the nucleus, they're slightly less well held, slightly easier to remove those electrons. So I am expecting that dip to show the difference in the sublevels between the S and the P. So these two do not have that, and so those are not correct in this case. The difference between A and C is this little dip here that I can see on C, which is between groups, 
So 1, 2, 13, 14, groups 15 and groups 16. So that's between the nitrogen and the oxygen here. So for nitrogen, you can see that that P orbital is 2P3. So it would look like this, single occupied orbitals. For oxygen, that same p orbital has an extra electron in it, so it's going to go into there like this. So for oxygen, is it easier to remove an electron than it is in nitrogen? So for nitrogen, I would be taking an electron from like maybe here, they're all the same, so I could pick any. Whereas for oxygen, I'm definitely removing this one here, okay? And in actual fact, this electron from the oxygen is way, way, way easier to remove because it's in a double filled orbital. And that means that it's experiencing additional electron repulsion from the other electron that's in that same orbital. So this electron in the 2P is way easier to take out than the one in the nitrogen. So you expect this dip like in option number C. This trend it should be something that you're pretty familiar with and make sure that you've gone through like how to explain it in words if you're asked what causes this dip here what causes this dip here make sure that you know how to answer those questions in simple language okay let's have a look at another question about how ionization energy changes across the periodic table so another way this question can be asked is this here which element is in group 13 and then they'll give you uh, the successive ionization energies for that element so if something's in group 13 we are looking here so this group with boron so this is the first group in the p block so that means that the outer energy level is going to be p1 whichever one this is boron is going to be 2p1 aluminium is going to be 3p1 etc etc so if we go back to this, what that means is it means that this first electron that's going to be removed is going to come from that p orbital, that p1 is going to come from there. If you're removing a second electron, that means that it's going to come from s2, and then this third one's going to come from s1. This fourth is going to come from the previous energy level because everything in group 13 only has like one, two, three things in it before you have to go back up to the next energy level. So what you're looking at here is between the P and the S, I'm looking for a fairly big jump, but I'm looking for an absolutely massive jump between the third and the fourth ionization energy. And the one that has the biggest jump between the third and the fourth is this one here, B. So we're just looking for that really, really big jump between those two, and that tells me that that one is the right answer. Okay, so last question about ionization energy. Check out this graph, it's pretty much exactly the same as in that first question we did on this. So you can see it's asking you to explain the drops in this graph, which is an absolutely classic question to be asked in this topic. So you've either got the drop between magnesium and aluminium or the drop between phosphorus and sulfur. So the first one says the nuclear charge of element aluminium is greater than magnesium. Now that is a true statement. Aluminium does have a greater nuclear charge, a greater number of protons than magnesium does. But it does not explain why there would be a decrease in first ionization energy. If that was the prominent reason, then actually you would expect aluminium to have a higher first ionization energy than magnesium did. You would expect it to be harder. So it doesn't explain why it's easier to remove that electron from aluminium than it is magnesium. So this one's a bit tricky because that is true, but it doesn't answer the question. The next one, the electron-electron repulsion is greater um, in element sulfur than in element phosphorus. We talked about this before. This is true based on what we talked about in uh, question 12. So the answer is B, but let's check the others. A new sublevel is being filled at element sulfur. That is not correct. Um, you're still in the P uh, sublevel. You're just going into the double-filled P orbitals. 
and then it says the p orbital being filled in aluminium is at a lower energy than s that's not correct either so these two are just not correct the first one doesn't answer the question the answer has to be b Okay, now let's talk about um, how we calculate first ionization energy from the convergence limits. This is pretty new to the syllabus, um, so you won't find so many questions on this, so it's really worth practicing and making sure you are A-OK -okay with it. So here, they've given us the convergence limit of um, hydrogen, and they've asked us to calculate the ionization energy in joules for a single atom of hydrogen using sections one and two of the data booklet. So they've given me a frequency and they want an energy. So in the data booklet, you'll find that in section one, they want us to use this, ooh, they want us to use this equation here, the E equals H nu that we had in our equations block. So E equals H nu. Now the energy is already in joules, H stands for Planck's constant, which remember we are going to find we are going to find in section two here Planck's constant. This 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. So let's put that in here. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. That's joule seconds. And I'm going to times that by the frequency they gave me, which is 3.28 times 10 to the 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, if we calculate all of that you get 2.17 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And this is the correct final answer for working out the ionization energy for a single atom of hydrogen. That's how much energy it would require. It's then asking, calculate the wavelength for that electron transition using section one. So remember the only equation that has wavelength in it is this C equals nu lambda. So we'll go back to that. So C equals uh, new lambda. So if we rearrange that, we'll get lambda equals C over new. So lambda is my wavelength, C is the speed of light, and new is the frequency. So the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. You can find that in the data booklet here, this one. Uh, 3 times 10 to the 8, I should really keep the dot zero, 0, I shouldn't remove those significant figures, and then we're going to divide that by the frequency that they gave me up top, so that's 3.28 times 10 to the 15 uh, per second. That overall gives us 9.15 times 10 to the minus 8 meters is the frequency. So this demonstrates using both of those equations um, and how to just chuck the numbers that they give you and where to find those constants. Let's have a look at this last question about first ionization energy and linking that to the equations on energy, frequency, wavelength, etc. So in this question, they're asking about copper and they're asking us to determine the frequency of a photon. So we're looking for a frequency, the new, to cause the first ionization of copper. So they're saying, okay, how much energy do I require to remove one electron from one atom of copper? They're telling me that I need to use sections one, two, that's pretty standard. One is the equations, two is the constant, so that's no surprise. But they're also asking me to look at section eight in the data booklet. Now section eight hasn't come up yet, so let's have a look at what section eight means. So if we scroll all the way to section, is this eight yet? No, this one is eight. It says first ionization energy, electron affinity, and electronegativity. I have that twisted around so that we don't have to tilt our heads to look at it. So in this one here, what you can see is the copper exists here in the periodic table, and the part of this periodic table that we're going to use is the first ionization energy, which is in kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to take this 745 into my answers here. So 745 kilojoules per mole. And that means that I require 745 kilojoules of energy to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of copper atoms. Okay, so what I want to be able to do is to utilize the equation E equals HV, like E equals H nu, which is the frequency. 
so that I can get this frequency of the photon. Now, if I'm gonna use that equation, then I need the energy for one, energy for one electron to be removed from the atom, not a mole of electrons. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this energy and we're gonna say, okay, the energy to ionize one atom. This one is the energy to ionize a mole of atoms. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this number, the 745, and we're going to divide it by Avogadro's number, the 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Now, I've left this 745 without any units on it, which I don't normally do, um, but the reason for that is that I want to convert it to joules, because for this equation, I need the energy in joules, and up here, this is in kilojoules. So I'm going to times this by 1,000 to get it into joules, which gives me 745,000 joules, uh, and then divided through by Avogadro's constant. So that gives me 1.24 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. The amount of energy required for a photon to cause the ionization energy of copper. So now this can go into this equation, the E equals H nu. I'm gonna rearrange that for nu because I want the frequency. So it becomes E over H. The E, I just worked out, the 1.24 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And then we're going to divide that through by Planck's constant, which came up earlier as this one here, the 6.63. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. If we calculate that, it gives me 1.87 times 10 to the 15, and the units is per second for frequency. And that is the final answer for these two marks here. And that is all. Um, thank you for watching this video. Uh, I hope you learned something or you felt super reassured that you're prepared for your test or your mocks on this topic. Um, atomic structure is a small topic, but is one that is worth getting right. So just keep practicing. Uh, leave me any comments if you have any questions or any feedback. Um, I would love to hear from you. See you next time.